We're delighted to have as our first speaker in this series on classmate experiences, Gary Albrecht. Now, a bunch of us were lawyers, a bunch of us were doctors, but I know of only one classmate who was a policeman, and that's Gary Albrecht. And he ended his police work as the chief of the United States Capitol Police. And during the uh, Clinton administration, you may remember, some people came in and killed two people in the Capitol building, two police officers. There was a, uh, a memorial service under the dome. Speaking uh, were President Clinton, Senator Trent Lott, and Gary Albrecht, dressed as the head of the U.S. Capitol Police. Um, Gary, whose, whose father studied under Reinhold Niebuhr at uh, Union Theological Seminary, went to the College of Geneva for his uh, high school work. It was founded by John Calvin. And after graduating from Yale, he taught Latin in the D.C. public schools for two years. Then he became a patrolman, and eventually he became the deputy chief of the D.C. police, after which he became U.S. Capitol Police Chief. Gary, we're delighted to hear from you. Uh, so glad you're here. Okay, I guess I'll just start by figuring out, telling you the answer to the first question is how the heck did I get into this uh, situation? Uh, and it's, the, the first thing I would say about it is it is definitely not uh, a, a uh, process for choosing a career that you would, uh, that any uh, college placement office would recommend. Uh, it's serendipitous in the, in, in its, uh, in the most uh, I was, uh, when I graduated from Yale, we, I was, or as I was headed out of graduation from Yale, I was supposed to be going in the Peace Corps to uh, Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso, I am told. Uh, but in my senior year, I fell in love with my wife, Mary Ellen, who's sitting out there in the, uh, uh, and we decided that uh, in that brief period of time, and would probably not, this relationship would probably not survive uh, for a couple of, for a two year stint in, of separation. So I quit the Peace Corps and went and found a job in Washington teaching Latin to sixth graders. We married in 1968, and Mary Ellen moved to, to Washington. Uh, and she started looking for a job in social service and stumbled upon the, the role of policewoman, which was a completely separate occupation from being a police officer back in those days of sex discrimination. Uh, it was only involved with, the, uh, with youth work, uh, Youth, ju juvenile delinquency, juvenile ne child neglect, and stuff like that. Uh, but every night she came home, so the, she, the, the training was the same as for men. She went to the police academy, and every night she'd come home and tell me all the fantastic things she was learning about constitutional law and criminal law and sociology and all sorts of things that sound a way lot more interesting than teaching Latin to sixth graders. So uh, at, the end, after, at the end of that year, I uh, snuck off to the recruiting office and took the uh, police exam and joined the department myself. Uh, I, my, my, part of my scheme was I thought I would go to law school eventually and uh, that this would look better on my resume than another year of teaching Latin. Uh, and in fact, it, 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 a little later, in, uh, I decided that I didn't want to go to law school, but she decided she did, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> so, here we go. Let's see if this actually works. Look at that. There I am in the back with the green arrow pointing at me as, as a police officer at the police academy. And... Uh, because I was first in my class at the police academy, which was not very hard uh, g given the, the academic uh, competition was not very stiff at the police academy, I, I got to choose where I went and I chose to go and work downtown. And that's where we started occasionally encountering ourselves professionally. There we are in front of the juvenile court. Uh, she's, uh, we're both there for some, some business. And as you might suspect, uh, the, the, the prospect of a couple of, uh, of Ivy League graduates joining the police department did not go unnoticed by the media. So this is an article from Life magazine about, uh, it was primarily about her, but about the two of us in, in, in uh, police work. Uh, what, I was, what I was doing was patrolling downtown Washington. There I am. Uh, this is from one of the Life article pictures. Uh, walking the streets, I, or, oops and uh, interviewing a citizen uh, as, as we went along. And 
And then, uh, as you might imagine, police, you, you'll remember the times, policing was, was changing quite a lot during that period. So as I, as I moved up in the police department in my career, I got to be involved in some of the issues that were facing policing during that time. Uh, this was after the, uh, we recall, this was after the 68 riots in Washington uh, and all over the country following Martin Luther King's assassination, uh, the, the various uh, demonstrations at the Chicago Convention uh, that caused quite a, a lot of turmoil. And there was a, quite, a great deal of examination of, of, the, of police work in, in the country and what, uh, what should be done about it to improve it and so forth. And one of the things I got to do was uh, work, I got detailed from the police department to uh, do a study of what's now all, all of a sudden another a new, newly a, a big issue, police use of deadly force. And did, we did this study that, for the police foundation and I was as a detail from the police department. Um, so then I did, what I did was do visits around the country of the police departments to figure out uh, what was going on. Uh, I began thereafter a rise through, through the ranks of the police department. Uh, this was fairly easy because the promotional examinations were all multiple choice tests and our alma mater had prepared me well for that sort of thing. And, <laughs> So I pretty much clobbered the competition at that, at that game. Uh, I remained in the uniform patrol force pretty much my entire career at, at, at the Metropolitan Police Department with a couple of short examples. I was, short exceptions, I was director of planning for the police department for a number of years and also the director of equal employment opportunity for a time. Uh, but then ultimately I became the deputy chief in charge of the first district, the whole downtown business district of, and a, a substantial residential area as well. You recall this is a dark, these were dark days in the city. This was, uh, the, Washington was known as the murder capital of the, of the United States at that time. Crime was on the, was on the rise uh, and there was, a, there was a lot of work to do and it was a, it was a pretty, pretty tough time. We did have a lot of success, however. We installed the first sort of rudimentary, by today's standard, community policing program. Uh, we uh, did, had some real success in the first district in reducing crime. And I, I did that for about four years, and then uh, I started looking around for something else to do. Uh, one of the things I actually applied for was to be chief of the uh, Yale campus police. Uh, and I had to withdraw from that when Mary Ellen became a judge on the uh, local court in Washington, and, which had been her lifetime ambition, so it was clear that we were going to stay in town. So ultimately, I applied for and became the chief of police at the United States Capitol. Uh, I should have known this was probably not, not the great, world's greatest idea when uh, the, the uh, whole thing got deadlocked for a year in a battle between the House and Senate sergeants at arms. Uh, the House wanted, wanted somebody else and the Senate wanted me, and there we sat for a year while the well, infighting went on. This was resolved when the House Sergeant Arms got indicted. Uh, <laughs> whoops, well, it would be nice if I could get the pages straight here. The primary, the primary function of, of the Capitol Police is, just, is the security of, the, uh, of the, the, the complex up there, the Capitol building, all of the staff. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough job. It's a tough situation. The, uh, it's, a, it's a wide open campus. It's not like the White House. It's got a big fence around it. It's, uh, people can come right up to the buildings. Uh, it's, it's expected to be open. Congressmen want everybody, all their constituents when they come to Washington to be able to come and visit them. So you have to have security in an extremely open environment, which is, which is very difficult. Uh, when I arrived in 92, uh, George H.W. Bush was the, was the president. Uh, but the president, whoops, sorry, that's my retirement uh, sketch from the, uh, from the Metropolitan Police Department. This was a thing in the police department to have somebody on, do, a picture, do a sketch of you and your, all your friends signed it. Uh, so George Bush became the, uh, what was the president when I arrived. Uh, but the election campaign of uh, 92 was just, uh, was just getting underway, and shortly thereafter, uh, Bill Clinton became, became the president, and one of the first things that I was involved in was uh, his, uh, his inauguration. And he was basically the president for the entire time, or practically the entire time uh, that, uh, that I was uh, 
we, we, the first thing we, the, the, the members of Congress are also very involved in the, uh, in the conventions, so we did a lot of uh, security for that, so I had a whole bunch of, these just sort of the, one of the many security badges that we were carried around. And ultimately, of course, we had the inauguration itself on the west front of the Capitol. You can imagine the security involved. This was a year of, a year of planning uh, for that. I'm told I can use this little button here and it will point something out. Ah. Not as well as I thought it would. Anyway, there was a, one of those little round windows up there next to the red door is where my, our little command post was, and that's where I was during the inauguration. And I even got to ride in the inaugural parade. The day-to-day -day job basically involved the administration of a huge organization and planning for all these security events at the Capitol. Uh, you're just a couple of the visitors who had. There's Mr. Gorbachev, and there's uh, Francois Mitterrand, the French president, who came to visit. Uh, and we had the arrangements for all of these things were, as you can imagine, incredibly complicated. There was also some fun bonuses. This is, every year, the president invited everybody from the Congress down to the White House for his Christmas party, and uh, we got the opportunity to go up to a number of those. But then there were, but my my time at the Capitol was really overshadowed by something that's, that uh, Tom mentioned in his in his remarks, uh, which was the uh, shooting the shooting of two officers in the Capitol building. Uh, on July 24th, uh, 1998, a madman named Russell Weston, uh, if you don't remember the details of his story, walked into the Capitol building and shot two officers, uh, killing them both. Uh, they were both transported to hospitals, but ultimately uh, they both died in the hospital. And obviously the next few hours were just consumed with uh, sitting, sitting with uh, widows and their children in, 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 at first at one hospital and then at another hospital. Uh, with the aftermath of the, the funerals, the uh, memorial service that, Doug, that uh, Tom mentioned in the rotunda. Uh, and then just months and months of investigations and uh, planning for, sec for security improvements at the Capitol and interments. At Ar they, were, we, they, were in, they were interred at Arlington. There were immense parades. It was, it was a, a very difficult time. It was a very logistically and it was a really horrible time for the for the widows and children who just were were grieving for 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 months thereafter or years thereafter i saw all of all this all of it to its conclusion and all of these uh, investigations and improvements and studies and so forth and i retired in 2000 a few a few more a few months before 911 caused yet another whole round of these security studies and much more uh, much more extensive security and improvements even than, were, than occurred on, on my watch. In retirement, uh, right after great retirement, I came up here for my daughter's graduation in the class of 2000, which was a nice uh, relief. Uh, and I've been leading hikes uh, on the Appalachian Trail. I've been volunteering at all various places in Washington. I'm on a board of a little community foundation at our church. I, I uh, volunteer at the National Cathedral one day a week where I, my fondness for uniforms is rewarded. I, uh, I wear a purple cassock now. My wife says I just I wear a purple dress and wander to and fro. Uh, <laughs> the only, only police thing I'm currently involved is, is that the, my successor, my fifth in a row, my fifth successor since my time there, uh, they, I, I, they don't last as long as I did, apparently. Uh, he, he, it's very nice. He invites me to all the recruit graduations and things, and things like that. And more recently, the uh, mayor of Washington has succeeded in prevailing on me to sit on something called the Concealed Pistol Licensing Review Board. So if you come to Washington, apply to carry a gun, and you're turned down, you get to uh, appeal to me. There you go. I've done it in my 15 minutes. Uh. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to see all of you here. We worked hard to uh, encourage you to do so, and you responded just beautifully and 
we're so happy. It's a victory for each one of us to be here. Um, I'm happy to introduce a classmate who, with his wife, Janet, has just traveled 75, actually 8,000 miles to get here from the intriguing country of uh, Bhutan and the Himalayas. Doug at Yale majored in chemistry and art history and earned his wings with Yale Aviation, a skill he later used to fly around the world. Um, after getting his Harvard MBA and DBA, uh, Doug and his wife Janet, who is a Harvard graduate and a Harvard PhD, um, started their journey. They worked with African American colleges in Atlanta, the federal government in Washington, and then Doug began a career in banking. But after a leadership change, you know how that can go, um, he started his own business and it flourished for 20 years. Doug then had to fight through a year of cancer therapy and it opened the door uh, to a new life, which was helping uh, the country of Bhutan to launch their first private college. While visiting and working in more than 110 countries, they produced three daughters, two Yaleys, one Harvard. <laughs> the best of all. So let's learn more about our man in Bhutan, I've been waiting to say that. <laughs> Please welcome Doug and Janet Schofield. Thank you. Thank you all. The Lord Buddha, in both his life and his teachings, had three major themes. One is impermanence, or what Bob Dylan would say, the times they are changing. Second is the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. And the third important theme was the value, the importance of getting out of your comfort zone getting out in the world to learn from other people, all the other people who share the earth with us. And I think even though I'm not at all a religious person, these three themes are very emblematic of, of the life I have led. Um, I was quite blessed to have two very outgoing, courageous parents who also believed, particularly in this last theme of getting out in the world to understand people, to learn from them. And when I was at the ripe old age of 12, my father decided to pack up the car, drive from Cleveland to Panama on the so-called Pan American Highway, uh, which at that time was a one-lane dirt track. It was an extraordinary adventure, but more importantly, meeting extraordinary people. Uh, for instance, a group of Mayan Indians at two in the morning, patching our car together uh, so we could limp into the village 50 miles away after it was badly damaged. Um, in due course, we did make it to Panama, and the very next year, uh, my mother, thinking a little more broadly, decided a part of our education, my sister, brother, and me, would be to spend an entire summer in the Middle East and Asia. This was not a tourist trip. It was more, as I was saying, to meet people, understand different perspectives, and from that, build a richer life and a better understanding life. It was also an eye-opening experience. One of our early stops was this Palestinian refugee village. My first encounter with people who had been driven out of their country and were struggling to get along. Little did I realize at that time that literally three generations later, I would end up in this same village working with women to build uh, their own businesses to support their families. This has been a common theme of my life, of doing things early in life, not expecting that the cycle of life comes back in different places, different times. We also tried to go to Nepal. Not all that easy on this Indian Airlines DC-3, little tattered flying through the, the passes because it couldn't get over the mountains. It also had quite a large hole in the fuselage, made it a little windy, but frankly, it's better than United Airlines. <laughs> a 
I think we also encountered just situations we'd never seen before. In America, you don't see a view like you do in Kolkata. We also encountered people who, despite many physical hardships, economic hardships, nonetheless were happy. A little while later, at the old age of 15, a friend and I decided we'd see more of the U.S. by pretending to be Huck Finn, going down from Cincinnati to New Orleans on this massive boat. <laughs> it, it was a lesson in meeting incredibly different cultures within our country. Again, pockets of people we'd never realized existed there. It was also a lesson in problem solving. You can't imagine the number of things that go wrong on a boat like this. <laughs> and, of course, Yale graduation. This is my wife-to-be, Janet. Uh, she was considering a marriage proposal, uh, which included, importantly, a wedding gift of hiking boots. <laughs> Took her a year to decide, even with an inducement like that. But uh, after graduation, she set off around the world with a Harvard singing group, presenting over 50 concerts in, oh, I don't know, 15, 16 countries, everything from small villages in the Philippines to the Edinburgh Festival. In parallel, I decided to head out to Africa, where I was, my plan was to hitchhike and take local trains all the way across Africa. Plans don't work very well in Africa. But some things do work extraordinarily well. This is on a five-day trip trying to get uh, all the way to Timbuktu from the Ivory Coast. Uh, we were five days into what turned out to be a seven-day trip, long way. But along the way, a very poor African family basically adopted me, took me on as if I were a son, shared their meager meal with me all the way as we went day after day along the way. A lot of things I encountered on that trip you don't find anywhere else. Uh, people so poor that they still wear animal skins, they can't afford clothes. Slums like this, un unimaginable in America. Along the way, getting back to the U.S., I met the Fijian arm of my family. My cousin had moved to Fiji when she was 20, married a Fijian, and wound up with a wonderful family there. Just by virtue of being part of that extended family, people all over Fiji took me in, just like I was a member of the family. Quite literally, that's how they treated me. After we married, uh, Janet got the hiking boots. Ten years later, we found ourselves here, which you'll recognize is the middle of the Sahara Desert. This was a trip not only in, in space, but also in time. We encountered cave paintings that showed this as a, a lush grassland a mere 7,000 years before. Hiking boats don't, don't last that long. These died on the trip, unfortunately. Later on, uh, Janet made some new friends in Vanuatu, uh, a remote island in, in the Pacific. Sadly, a lot of the best things we saw no longer exist. This happy boy has known nothing but civil war in Kashmir almost all of his 40 years. As you know, the Taliban blew up these statues in Afghanistan. This drove home an important lesson that I didn't learn from Professor Christian in my comparative religion course here freshman year. Religion is an extremely powerful force, not only for good, but certainly also for evil. Fortunately, some things have flourished. These students, 35 years ago in Bhutan, are now part of the leadership of the country. They've gone through enormous changes that make their country almost unrecognizable compared to what it was then. In due course, uh, I really want to mention, we weren't just nomads floating around the world all this time. Uh, as Barry mentioned, we've been in and out of graduate school. Our first real job was the Atlanta University Center in Atlanta, Georgia, naturally. And we were seven of the, we were two of the seven white folks out of 5,000 black students, staff, and faculty. It really drove home the point of what it's like to be in a minority. But it's a very different minority when you're white. And we were quite actively welcomed 
and ended up having a, a wonderful time feeling part of that community. Uh, I think the, the other step career-wise, if you could call it a career, it was really a nomadic career, was to deliberately sample different kinds of jobs to see what fit us best. And we were still idealistic, we were still quite naive, believing that one person could make a difference in something as big as the U.S. government. Don't believe it, it's not true. Uh, except maybe Gary, where he does indeed make a difference. I worked for the Transportation Department for the Deputy Undersecretary, evaluating the programs and writing speeches for my boss. Sadly, my speechwriting career came to an abrupt end when my boss went to jail for his role in Watergate. I didn't want to follow him, so I passed on that. And it came time to look for a new job in the depths of the recession in the early 70s. I put in 52 job applications, finally got one response, which is what took me into international commercial banking. It was quite an interesting job. One of the many things I did there was managing worldwide foreign exchange trading. Every day I was on the phone with six very different cultures, four other countries, and New York and Pittsburgh. Believe me, New York and Pittsburgh are two different cultures. <laughs> in time, I decided to move on to a smaller bank. You'll notice a progression here, going from huge to smaller and smaller, and ended up in a smaller bank in Pittsburgh, where I worked for the chairman, trying to raise capital faster than our lending officers were losing it. Uh, the last week I had in that job was a roller coaster. Uh, my boss called me in, gave me a promotion, slap on the back, a raise, keep up the good work. Tuesday, the board fired him. Wednesday, the new chairman fired me and 30 other people all that morning. Thursday was busy. We had planned to move to a new home in anticipation of having two paying jobs and a new child. And the following week, we had a new child. Uh, so, moving on. I decided big organizations were not for me and ended up joining a friend of mine, a former banker, in a financial advisory business, uh, catering to, to executives and to wealthy families. But here's a case of impermanence, as if you haven't heard enough of them already. Uh, Price Waterhouse came along, wanted us to merge into their business. Uh, my partner wanted stability, I wanted independence, and that's what led to the second card on this slide, being a solo person, gradually building up a business over 20 years. For me, the business was interesting, it was productive. I moved from being number 7,000 in the field of competitors to number 69, things were going well. But the most important thing was freedom. I had the freedom to be with our children, freedom to introduce them to many things we had seen around the world, to start the process over again of introducing them really to the rest of the world. And this is, it, that is a real live python around her neck. Uh, along the way, during that time, I also used about a third of my time for what I'd call executive volunteering, which meant uh, working in essentially executive positions, but on a volunteer basis. Uh, ten years with Save the Children advising on microfinance programs, four women borrowing money to support their family, this is a unique situation where I was negotiating with the Women's Communist League of Vietnam uh, to do a joint venture with a capitalist to help out the women who needed those jobs. And these are examples. Everything comes to a halt when impermanence strikes again. You don't want to get one of these. That's melanoma, advanced, a year of uh, awful treatment. And for all that, you've got a 50-50 chance of surviving it. Not a good prospect. I saw three options. Proactively call hope, passively play out the whatever time I had left, but with enormous support from my wife, who gave up her job as a, a professor, her flourishing career in that, we decided on the last path of rebirth. 
we decided we'd start something entirely different, something that would be very interesting, very productive, and outside the U.S. We did a job search through many of the countries of Asia, ending up in Bhutan. Anyone know who, where Bhutan is? Not too many takers. It's in the middle of the Himalayas, sandwiched between Tibet and India, an ancient kingdom. And this is one of the better bridges in the country. <laughs> what really makes Bhutan stand out in many ways is the hereditary kings who've been in charge for 100 years now, extraordinarily enlightened people. The third king abolished serfdom. He brought the country out of the Middle Ages. He also set up the first school, literally the first school, and the first road, uh, physically and metaphorically, in and out of the country. There are a lot of cultural issues that are very different. Uh, one of our friends here, you may not recognize him, but uh, behind that mask, he's actually a nice guy. Our main role was to be part of a five-person team starting the first private college. Private is important because it's a country dominated by the government in all sorts of ways. Uh, we were private in the sense we didn't get any money from the government, but we were subject to enormous regulations. You can see here the unbelievably diverse faculty, our first group, Indians, Bhutanese, and a smattering of, of Westerners. It's quite a, a festival when any important thing goes on. This is opening day at the college. Uh, no event is anything in Bhutan without some sort of Buddhist ceremony. Uh, there you can see a few of our professors, including Janet, and our first cohort of students. We grew extraordinarily fast. Went from zero to 1,200 students in four years and had our first graduation, which frankly puts Yale to shame. Uh, th this is a, a real celebration. And uh, uh, some other things we did, uh, for instance, first day we opened, we had a management meeting, and the girls complained. The dormitory was haunted. We had to get rid of the ghosts, and we had to do it fast. We have an extraordinary founder of the college, a graduate of Yale Management School, Berkeley Engineering, and used to run the biggest electric company in Bhutan. Uh, he sized up the situation and said, no problem. Uh, I see you running out of time. I'll finish that story later. We had some side jobs. Here you see uh, we taught monks at a remote monastery for a number of years, teaching them English, and we learned about their life. This is Yale at 16,000 feet, uh, one of our favorite places where uh, we met a Tibetan monk in his third year of solitary meditation. Important event, the Yale Club of Timpu being founded. Three of us got together, and there we are. We also met, and know reasonably well, here the Prime Minister, head of the Supreme Court, the King. But for all this, we, we've also, in recent years, diversified moving uh, additional activities, if you will, into our schedule. We spent last year uh, two months in Cambodia working for a peace organization, and Janet taught at a Polish university later in the year with Bhutan in between. So you might say, what's next? Lots of possibilities, but we see more impermanence on the way. Uh, my daughter has promised 28 days from now our first grandchild will be born, who no doubt will influence our trajectory from here. Thank you very much. And talk to you Thank you very much. You want to sit here? Do you want to sit? Good afternoon. I'm Bill Mace, and I'm pleased to introduce my uh, old friend John Wilhelm today. Uh, yet another Trinity parent, but that's not here what he, Trinity, I'm a Trinity. He's a, a Yale parent, I should say, uh, among the many here. Um, so John, as uh, many of you know, uh, started union work uh, here in New Haven. Uh, Yale knows about much of his work. He uh, became uh, ultimately president of I, the uh, 
Unite Here uh, uh, Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union uh, and has made uh, obviously quite a large impact and reputation. So I think you'll hear about a fair amount from John. I'm not competent to operate a clicker and talk, so it's just going to scroll. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Bill. And I, I'm really fascinated by listening to Gary and Doug, really fascinating lives that probably every one of us has led in our own, in our own way, but it's, not, it's wonderful to hear those two stories. Um, I have uh, four uh, colleagues with me who are members of the unions at Yale, and I'd like to just very briefly introduce them. I, I wish we had time for you to hear from each of them, but having been instructed that the hook will arrive at the appropriate time, I, I, I do want to introduce them. Uh, Taisha Walker. Taisha is a native of New Haven. She started in the Yale Dining Halls in 1998, and because of the Local 35 contract mechanism, she was able to become a full-time uh, dining hall worker. Uh, she has two children. Uh, one, the, first, the older one graduated from Hill House High School and a couple of weeks ago graduated from Quinnipiac College with the aid of the Yale tuition program. Um, <laughs> and her younger daughter is just uh, entering Hill House. Taisha is the number two officer of Local 35, which is the service and maintenance union at Yale. It's one, the union that's been here the longest. It's the, what is sometimes referred to as the blue collar union. Um, she became a, an, uh, as the term is used in New Haven, an alder. When we were undergraduates, it was alder men, but they dropped the men because now they have women. Um, and it's the equivalent of the city council. She became uh, an elected alder from her neighborhood in 2011. Uh, she is now the president of the New Haven Board of Alders. She's the first African-American president of that body, the first African-American woman, therefore, uh, president uh, of that body. And definitely the first Yale dining hall worker who's the president of the Board of Alders in New Haven. <laughs> Next, I want to introduce a member of Local 34, Samantha Violanti. Uh, Samantha has worked at Yale for five years. She's worked at Yale for five years as an accounting assistant in the Yale Medical School. Prior to that, uh, coming to work for Yale, she had essentially the very same job working for Yale New Haven Hospital for about $6 per hour less uh, and with uh, unaffordable health care benefits and very unfavorable retirement benefits. She's a single mother of two girls, aged 10 and 11. She's a cancer survivor, and she told me that her health benefits from Yale University were absolutely crucial in her ability to get through that. And because of the salary she earns under the Local 34 contract, she, she's able to work just one job. Now, that may not sound like much, but it means that she can be part of her daughter's lives and raising them and their schools and their sports and all the other things that we like to be able to do as parents. She owns a home in West Haven, and she told me that there's no way I can give my kids what I can now. I'm not living in a lap of luxury, but I get along. And P.S., her great-grandfather built... Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> one of the original brick ovens at Pepe's. He was an Italian stonemason. <laughs> Frank Anderson is a uh, longtime leader of Local 35 at Yale and a retiree. <laughs> Frank came from South Carolina to New Haven at age 18 in 1955 as a part of what is sometimes called the Second Great Migration from the South. He started at Yale as a dishwasher almost as soon as he landed here in November 1955. Worked his way up to second cook. He was the first African-American top officer of Local 35, the first uh, business agent of Local 35. He met his wife, Marguerite, when they were both working in the Yale dining halls. They're both retired now, and, be, and between them, they have 94 years of service to Yale. Uh, and because... <laughs> Because of the pensions and the retiree health care that the unions and Yale have agreed upon, they own their own home in New Haven, and they can live here with some measure of dignity. And in his spare time as a retiree, Frank counsels other Yale employees who are getting ready to retire. 
And finally, I want to introduce Julia Powers, who is a PhD candidate in comparative literature. <laughs> Julia has been uh, uh, at Yale for five years uh, after coming from Montana to do her undergraduate work at Amherst. That's a small college up the road. Um, she was one of the uh, people who fasted uh, in the last few weeks uh, as a part of Local 33's efforts to get Yale to negotiate. She was also arrested in a civil disobedience uh, uh, last month protesting sexual harassment at Yale, and in particular sexual harassment at the grad school. If you have time, take a look at the Washington Post for May 12th of this year. She wrote a very powerful op-ed in the Washington Post about why she was a faster for Local 33 and about the issue of sexual harassment at Yale. Um, I don't know most of our classmates because I transferred to Yale and because for a lot of my undergraduate years I lived uh, off campus with my friend and partner Jake Blum, who I see here, uh, and with uh, other classmates including Mike Russell and others. Um, so I don't know the great majority uh, of you. Um, I, I, uh, the reason Jake and I and others moved off campus is we got involved in community organizing in the Hill neighborhood, which is over past the hospital. Um, when we graduated in 1967, I, didn't, I had no career plan whatsoever. Um, uh, in February of 1969, uh, Betsy Gilbertson, my wife who's here today, uh, and I were married, and she was uh, in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at Yale, and I was gainfully unemployed. Um, and I was supposedly looking for a job, um, and I read a want ad which caused me to apply for a job as a union organizer. Uh, and I undertook that for six months, and 43 years later, I retired. Um, and I have to say, uh, I loved every minute of it. Um, I want to go back to the people I introduced. These jobs and these pensions have great significance, certainly for these individuals. And I tried to briefly describe some of the ways these jobs mean a lot to them and their families. But I would suggest to you that these jobs mean a lot for Yale and for New Haven as well. It's become a truism that cities today rely on eds and meds, on educational institutions, hospitals, and other medical institutions to replace the kinds of manufacturing jobs that, uh, unfortunately, we have decided as a nation to uh, get rid of. Um, when we were undergraduates, New Haven was a very, very strong manufacturing town. It had Winchester rifles, and, the region, Winchester rifles and Armstrong tires and Pratt & Whitney aircraft engines, machine shops of all kinds. We made men's dress shirts. You probably wore a lot of them, Gant and Cerro and others. We made ladies' clothing. There was also a very large uh, telephone company staff, which probably is all computers by now. All those jobs are gone. Those jobs were almost all unionized, and they created an economically stable working class in New Haven. Now, poverty certainly existed in New Haven at that time, uh, beyond any question. But it was not as widespread as it is now. All those jobs are gone. Since virtually all those jobs I just briefly summarized are gone. Poverty is much more widespread here now. In New Haven, as in most American cities, you see homeless people on the street, which were not apparent when we were uh, undergraduates here. And the communities, even those that were poor, were, for the most part, not hopeless. But as those jobs disappeared, poverty got much worse in this city and in most American cities, and hopelessness spread. Uh, in those days, though, even though a lot of those other jobs could support a family. Yale's jobs in those days were impossible to support families on. Some of you may remember Bill Felder, the late Bill Felder. Bill was a first cook in Trumbull College when we were undergraduates, uh, and a long time before that and a long time after that, Bill worked at Yale for his entire adult life. Uh, when we were undergraduates, Bill worked three jobs to support his family, and his wife worked at Yale as well. And as soon as his kids graduated from high school, they came to work at Yale. Bill was the first cook at Trumbull, full-time. He was a part-time cook, cook at Scroll and Key, and he had another full-time job. And all the years I knew him then, that's what he had to do to support his family. Uh, so the Yale's jobs were characterized by low wages and very weak benefits, and Yale New Haven hospital jobs were essentially the same. Uh, so what happened? Well, our class was the 
last class for a long time that did not experience a strike of Yale workers during the time that the class was there. Um, there were strikes by Local 35, the, as I said before, the oldest union, the Yale Service and Maintenance Union, in 1968, 1971, 1974, and 1977, four consecutive contract expirations. Each one of those strikes was longer than the one before. And if you knew, let me go back to Bill Felder, if you knew him, you knew a couple things about him. One, he was very mild-mannered. And two, he loved Yale. And I mean that very genuinely, he loved Yale. But he felt compelled to be on those picket lines because he couldn't support his family. It's that simple, not very complicated. Uh, and then Yale's clerical and technical workers organized over the university's relentless opposition, uh, Local 34. And there was a, a very high profile semester long strike in 1984 supported uh, of Local 34, supported by Local 35, which finally led to their first contract. So there were 11 major strikes plus assorted other one day walkouts and, and, and smaller uh, confrontations uh, since 1968. The last strike was 2003. Uh, now, there are various interpretations of why all these strikes happened. Uh, I, I want to read you two. One came from the, the then communications director of Yale during the 2003 strike. Uh, she said that uh, uh, the problem was the intransigence of union leader and Yale alumnus John Wilhelm. For 30, and this is a quote from her. It, quote, for 35 years, John Wilhelm has organized strikes at Yale. This year is no different. He obviously believes that confrontation rather than cooperation is the best way to settle contract disputes. So that, that is one interpretation of what went on. Uh, there is an alternate interpretation um, exemplified by a quotation from a guy who's not a Yale alumnus named Theodore J. Rybacki, who was a senior partner at the firm that's still a major American law firm, Cypress Shaw. Now, uh, then known as Cypher Shaw, Fairweather, and Geraldton. Uh, Rybacki was a senior member of the uh, uh, labor law division of that firm. And he was publicly quoted as saying, quote, I belong to the bomb them into submission school of labor relations. And I was Yale's law firm in the 1984 trike and for quite a few years thereafter. So you can pick which interpretation you like. It's entirely up to you. Um, but what's the result of all of this? And I'm keeping an eye on the time. What's the result of all of this? Well, today, Yale jobs can support a family. There are comprehensive health benefits for the family that workers can actually afford to, to, to pay for. There are retirement benefits, as I said in talking about Frank Anderson, that enable people to live in dignity. I mentioned the tuition benefit. Until the 1985 union contracts at Yale, the tuition benefit for children of employees was limited to faculty and, and management. And in the 1985 contract settlements following that huge strike in 1984, the uh, members of Local 34 and Local 35 had that tuition benefit added to their benefits at Yale, and any one of them will tell you it's a wonderful thing to be able to have that. Uh, unfortunately, oh, and back to Bill Felder, at the end of Bill's career, he was able to work one job, not three. So, unfortunately, the same thing cannot be said of Yale New Haven Hospital jobs. I'm sure something will happen to that someday. Um, so what happened? Well, sure, we had a lot of strikes and a lot of struggle, a lot of strife, a lot of turmoil. But the other thing that happened, and I credit President Levin to a large degree for this, Yale came to the realization that its vitality and its market position, if you will, require that New Haven be a livable place. And as all of you know, there was quite a period of time when it wasn't particularly a livable place, either in the campus area or in many other parts of town. Uh, I think Rick Levin and his very talented vice president, Bruce Alexander, who I think was a year, a year behind us, I believe, uh, at Yale, uh, really figured that out. And then after the 2003 strike, President Levin also realized that New Haven couldn't succeed if Yale jobs were not net positive economic contributors, and if strikes constantly drove a wedge between the university uh, and the community. So President Levin and Bruce Alexander and Vice President Mike Peel, who's just retiring this month, uh, worked hard, and I was out of the picture by 
this new period, and so, which probably proves the Yale communications director was right. Uh, but one of the pictures you may have seen scroll through there was a picture of uh, President Levin and others uh, because under their leadership and with the hard work by the leadership of the unions, there have been four consecutive contract settlements with Locals 34 and Local 35 without, stri without strikes. Uh, and I'm very encouraged that the most recent of those came under uh, the, uh, President Salovey's uh, leadership. So I hope he continues in that. So I, I want to mention, as I close, a couple of other things that are usually overlooked when people talk about wages and benefits. I mentioned a couple of these in introducing my colleagues. The notion that parents can work one job instead of two or three is a complete sea change in terms of how people can raise families. You know, we're always uh, criticizing people who don't raise families properly. And parents who have trouble raising families get blamed a lot. Well, if you work two jobs, two full-time jobs, or two and a half, or three, think about trying to raise your kids that way. And of course, you can't afford help. Another one is the civic and political life of the community. I said that Taisha Walker is the, definitely the first Yale dining hall worker to be the president of the Board of Alders. I think that's a really important thing, and it can only happen if people have one job. And even more broadly than that, it means that people have a stake in making their families great and making Yale great. The members of our union love working for Yale. And they love taking care of the students and the faculty. Uh, the administration depends who they're talking about. But no, seriously, seriously, they, they love working for Yale. And they have a stake in making New Haven great, too. It's too bad that it took so much strife. Uh, Yale went down that road with Local 35. Uh, and then they went down that road again with Local 34. Sadly, it looks like they're going down that same road again with Local 33, which is the Graduate Teacher and Researcher Union, which I think is unfortunate. Uh, I would close this way. I think the future of New Haven and depends on a few things. I think it depends on continued cooperation between Yale and Locals 34 and 35. I think it depends on positive resolution of the Local 33 issue. I think it depends on getting Yale New Haven Hospital to follows, follow Yale's lead to model good jobs instead of jobs that detract from the community. And all these other jobs that are growing because Yale is here, biotech, for example, those jobs, for the most part, except for the very top, uh, are not net, net, net economic contributors, and they need to be. We can't make these cities work if tax-exempt institutions have over half the property, do not pay property taxes in Connecticut, like many places, the cost of municipal government, uh, including K-12 education, is driven primarily by property taxes. We can't make these cities work if these institutions both don't pay property tax and also have jobs that the taxpayers have to subsidize. Take Medicaid. You know, there's a tremendous amount of discussion in the media and in the political world now about Medicaid. Rarely is it mentioned that most people on Medicaid work for a living their employers don't provide any medical coverage because their employers are happy to let the taxpayers do it. That's not a, w a workable way. Forget how you feel about that in terms of your own personal moral outlook. We can't make any of these cities work that way. Uh, and then I would just say, finally, I have no idea how anybody in this room feels about the election of Donald Trump. You like him, you don't like him. That's up to you. But I'm not talking about Donald Trump, talking more broadly. I think global history shows that when people who work for a living no longer feel like stakeholders in the society, then they become, or can become, don't always, but can become fertile soil for demagoguery, for scapegoating of other religious or ethnic or racial groups, uh, and for fascism. So I think we need to figure out a way I would argue unions ought to be part of it. Somebody may have a better way to do that, and that's fine for the 21st century. We need to find out a way in this country and certainly around the world, as Doug and Janet have shown us, for people to feel like they have a stake. I've had fun trying to do a little bit about that in all the years that I 
worked for the union. Uh, now I do a little bit of pension work, much of which I did for a while with George Springer, one of our classmates. Uh, but mostly, Betsy and I play with our grandchildren, and I've loved every minute of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, thank you. Thank you. A couple of closing uh, housekeeping items. Doug has mentioned that he and Janet have brochures on the college in Bhutan. For anybody who's interested, more information on that. Second, if you're dropping by the neighborhood in Bhutan, please stop in. They'd be glad to welcome you. Come on down, or come on up in that case. Now, our next planned event is about two blocks this way. Go down College Street, out Prospect Street, past the Grove Street Cemetery to uh, Ben Franklin College. We're going to be one of the first groups to see it. I, it's not a hard hat tour, but they're going to show us um, as much as they can of it. It's beautiful. It's pristine. It's, as you know, it follows the designs of the classic uh, college system, and it, it should be a real treat. Some of our uh, athletic coaches will be there to talk and um, just to chat informally, and I think you'll enjoy it. It's a beautiful place, and it's another part of the future of Yale. Thank you.